Hi, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for being here and joining us to talk about climate risk. We're so glad to have you here um, with us. We're going to talk today about how regulators and advocates can harness physical and financial data to tackle the climate emergency. I'm the executive director of the State Energy and Environmental Impact Center at NYU School of Law, and we are so grateful to be co-hosting this series with Woodwell Climate Research Center and the Massachusetts AG's office. It is really an honor to be able to introduce AG Maura Healy to help kick us off. She will be speaking to us via video. AG Healy was sworn in as Attorney General of Massachusetts on January 21st, 2015. In office, she organized the Energy and Environment Bureau to bring together energy and environmental expertise and to combat climate change and promote environmental and energy justice. She has been an advocate for a more equal and inclusive workplace and worked to ensure that all of the state's residents are treated fairly. She has advocated for marriage equality and reproductive rights, worked to combat predatory lending and led many multi-state coalitions in advocating for strong environmental and energy laws. She has also focused on strengthening consumer protections, addressing escalating healthcare costs, improving our criminal justice system and protecting workers and students. She brings all of this incredible experience to bear today on the topic of climate risk. So without further ado, I will turn the event over to A.G. Healy. Thank you, Bethany, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this event series, which we're honored to co-host with Massachusetts' own Woodwell Climate Research Center, a hub of some of the world's best climate science. And to our other co-host, the State Energy and Environmental Impact Center at the NYU School of Law, which continues to do fantastic work supporting state AGs as we fight for strong environmental protections and cleaner energy. I also appreciate the help of Professor Madison Condon at BU School of Law, who was instrumental in putting this innovative series together. We're here today because we are in a crisis. Climate change is an emergency. It's getting worse, and we need to prepare for the dangers ahead. Here in Boston, we see what climate change means on the ground. High tides are now regularly swamping our waterfront. Extreme storms like Sandy and Irene have destroyed roads, bridges, and other infrastructure. Heat waves are killing people and making them sick, especially people of color and those in low-income communities. The ocean just off our coast is, is heating so rapidly that it's driving the right whale to extinction and decimating our fisheries. And that's just what's happening in my backyard, to say nothing of the wildfires that are ravaging the West, the floods, the droughts, the water shortages that are imperiling millions of people around the world. Now, I know this all sounds doom and gloom, but it's real and we need to act. Our first job is to stop making the problem worse. This means slashing greenhouse gas pollution and moving to a zero emissions economy as quickly as we can. We need to stop investing in fossil fuels and to accelerate our transition to clean energy. But we also need to prepare for the changes we know are coming, not in the distant future, but in the next few years. And this pandemic has given us a preview. All of the unprecedented trauma, injustice, and disruptions we've been living through are just a taste of what's coming from climate change. It has the potential to cripple our economy to harm the people and places we love and to bankrupt our state and local governments. That's why we're all here today, because we have the foresight to prepare, avoid dire outcomes, and with smart investments that truly build resilience where we need it, we can prosper. To do this work, we need a much better and much more detailed idea of what climate change will mean for our neighborhoods and our neighbors. And for the investments, we've made and will be making. We need to ensure that data and analysis gathered from scientists and the private sector doesn't just sit on the shelf. It needs to be in the hands of policymakers, investors, and most importantly, local communities that are already bearing the brunt of this all. That's why I joined with other AGs in calling for strong climate investment and disclosure rules from the SEC, the Department of Labor, and the US Treasury. In this series, you'll be hearing from leading scientists, analysts, advocacy leaders, and policymakers who are working on these issues every day. 
We are grateful to them for their willingness to share their thoughts. All of us from town halls to Wall Street have a role to play in preparing for the impacts of climate change. So thank you for joining us for today's events. Let's commit to putting what we learn into action to help us protect people, our communities, and our future. Thank you, AJ Healy. In a moment, I will turn it over to Eric Broston, Sustainability Editor at Bloomberg, who will moderate our expert panel. But first, a few logistics. Please submit your questions using the Q&A feature as, chat, um, as the chat is unavailable for that. And we should have time to pose those near the end, but we also welcome questions throughout. The bios for all of our speakers are available in the chat. We'll place the link there so you could read more about them there. Eric, please take it away. Thanks very much and welcome everyone to uh, what's uh, a timely and uh, uh, really important uh, panel with a, a lot of news and, and newsmakers uh, joining us today. Uh, I, I like the title of this uh, session, uh, Seeing the Dangers Ahead is uh, takes on new meaning in uh, 2022 when we can already see so many dangers behind us. Uh, and I also like the phrase beyond the IPCC. The IPCC, uh, many people probably know, is the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the worldwide organization of volunteer scientists who write up their uh, 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 sort of the state of the uh, of the of climate science uh, every seven or eight years. We're currently in the middle of a new IPC cycle. Um, and we're here today to discuss what comes next for uh, more than 30 years, almost 35 years, the IPCC has been the end all be all encyclopedia of climate science, but it won't help you decide uh, where to build a new factory, uh, how high to build, uh, how tall to build your dock and uh, many other many practical questions. Um, so I want to introduce uh, our, our panelists now. We have uh, Christopher Schwalm, who's a uh, risk program director and senior scientist at Woodwell Climate Research Center. Uh, Matthew Eby, founder and executive director of First Street Foundation. Juliet Finzi Hart, who's program manager and climate services lead for California's integrated climate adaptation and resiliency program. And Mekala Krishnan, partner at the McKinsey Global Institute. So I'll uh, throw it open. I mean, you were trying to set up basically a pipeline of information here uh, from scientists to decision makers. And I wonder if uh, Christopher or, or Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew, maybe one of you wants to kick us off since you're uh, very close to the science uh, itself and can bring to light how you translate it and begin to translate it into a usable forum for decision makers. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to, to start, Eric, and thanks for the, the introduction. Uh, so at the First Street Foundation, we're, we're a nonprofit, and we really focus on uh, taking this, this climate science, all this great work that's going on in these uh, peer-reviewed journals and based on decades of knowledge and really making it into applied science. And so those uh, insights and knowledge that can then be used to give an, an indication of what risk looks like. So what we create is uh, nationally available hazard layers that can, at a property level, let you know what your risk of flooding might be. So we do that through something called Flood Factor, and that data then allows you uh, to go to floodfactor.com as a consumer and understand what your risk might be today and how it'll change over the next 30 years. But we have those stats aggregated and those hazard layers aggregated for state and local governments to also uh, take on and then understand where the pockets of risk might be and where adaptation may be best deployed so that you can have the highest ROI uh, for your city or county or, or state. So really bringing to life those risk statistics at a property level, but then aggregating them up to then unlock insights that you otherwise wouldn't get if you're just looking at kind of a global climate ensemble and using a downscaled approach there. Excellent. Um 
I can, of course, speak a little bit to the types of engagement that we are involved with at the Woodville Climate Research Center. Um, at the highest level, I think I would use a three basket classification. We do have a very sustained outreach effort to work with private sector actors. And the fundamental premise here is that physical climate risk is simply not priced into the market. And we very much distill down through this very dense ecosystem of of earth observation data streams, as well as climate simulation experiments to be able to answer questions that, for example, an investor would like to ask, right? That's a, that's a very key thing here because to link back to some of the initial comments with regards to the IPCC, a lot of the questions that this particular process answers are not really questions that a decision maker would ask. So that's one significant form of engagement that we have. The second one that I'd briefly like to highlight is this notion of outreach to overexposed communities. The fundamental premise here is that no one should be paywalled away from climate insight. And so a lot of our engagement here is very much philanthropically supported, such that we work with communities. It's very much based on the co-production of knowledge. Again, ask, or <clears throat> excuse me where we answer questions that a decision maker would ask. And again, these types of assessments are provided at zero cost. Uh, one of the things that I would be remiss in not mentioning is that the fundamental storytelling around climate change, I think is very unimaginative. There still seems to be this idea that it'll be a slight linear offset from the standard routine that we have now. And in terms of interacting with this very dense data ecosystem, that's very much not the case. We are already in a one degree world. And if we contrast that with a three, three and a half or four degree world, which are still highly plausible outcomes, these are just completely different from what we have today. And it's very important to tell that story. And that's something else that we as an institution are very much engaged with. Uh, Mikola, you told a very big story this week. Uh, tell us a little bit about your report. Uh, and uh, then Juliet, if you want to uh, tie it together with uh, the end users. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this, the, the report that, that Eric is describing that we launched, um, this was a collaboration across various groups at McKinsey, the McKinsey Global Institute, which is um, where I work with the McKinsey and Companies Business and Economic Research Arm. Uh, but also various other practices within McKinsey, internal, external advisors. Uh, what we wanted to do was actually chapter two of uh, a two-part series, chapter one, and I'd love to talk about chapter one in, in a moment as well. Chapter one was where we examined the implications, the socioeconomic impacts of climate change. We actually collaborated both with uh, Christopher and folks at Woodwell, as well as uh, Matthew and folks at the, the First Street Foundation to do exactly what you're describing, Eric, which is take climate data and transform it into a set of um, variables, metrics, um, things that guide decisions for private sector companies, but also uh, public sector stakeholders and, and communities. So that was chapter one. It essentially created the imperative for action towards the net zero transition. What we launched this week was chapter two of that, of that, uh, that chronicle to say that given what we know about rising physical risks, uh, what does that do in terms of the imperative for the transition? And what would taking, what, what would action on the transition actually entail? Um, and so this research that, that we just launched examined a whole range of um, sectors. We, we looked at sectors that accounted for about 85% of global emissions. We looked at um, about 69 different countries and the scale of economic shifts that would be needed to try and get us to net zero. Um, A.G. Healy described in her remarks uh, almost a two-part agenda that we need as we think about addressing climate change. The first is, of course, decarbonizing to reduce emissions, but the second is, is adapting to the physical risks that are locked into the system. And so e each of our bodies, the two big bodies of research that I described, um, address uh, different parts of that puzzle. All right. Juliet, what, uh, how could you uh, take it from there and describe like what, what this uh, information about risk really needs to look like for it to be useful to people who, who are making decisions about infrastructure and, and community safety? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be here today too. 
Um, so I'm Juliette Hart, and I'm on, I think, the other side of the country to most of the folks that are on the panel today, but I'm in California, and I work for the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Um, the team that I'm a part of is, um, the, is the, the second half of what Mikla was just saying about the resilience side. So we're the Integrated Climate Adaptation Resiliency Program. It's a mouthful, so I'll refer to it as ICARP moving forward. But ICARP was established in around 2016 by legislation, and the idea behind it was that OPR can serve as this OPR Office of Planning and Research, that's my office, can serve as a hub for both state level work on resilience and adaptation, but also connecting to on the ground work. So I spend most of my time um, connecting with all of our state agencies, understanding what their different streams are doing, and then connecting to what is happening in the communities. We're advised by our technical advisory council that's comprised of local and municipal folks, and then um, you know, kind of members at large that represent different sectors. And they really drive the, the work that we do. Um, my particular lane within this broader team is, is climate services. And so um, I come from a science background. I love science. Um, I, I talk about science all day, all night long. Um, the thing that we are trying to do is take that science and help make decisions with it. So a lot of the, I think we're going to get into this as this panel continues, but we're really interested in, um, once we have the data, um, California has no shortage of really remarkable data from um, federal agencies, state agencies, private consultants, academics, we've got data. Um, the challenge is now, how do we bring this all together to help move conversations forward and actually get past the conversation to the implementation? So. Maybe I'll leave it at that and then look forward to some of the deeper questions to get into. Well, I think maybe we can, maybe we should drill down there and like, does each of you have like a sort of a specific example of, you know, an information, a piece of information, you know, an analysis and a user who it was useful to? Like, what's the spectrum of users we're talking about here? And what's the spectrum of actionable? information that they're they're seeking or, or even better being given yeah maybe, maybe I'm, I'm happy to start and I, I can give maybe two examples um so as i mentioned we did some research uh, i think in, back in 2020 working with with woodwell as well as the first street foundation to try and understand the socioeconomic impacts of a changing climate so as we start to see acute events like um, flooding or storms or wildfires intensify, as well as chronic events like um, just overall heat and humidity levels or precipitation intensify, what are the impacts of that on a set of stakeholders? Um, and so this essentially, think about it as an equation that we were able to develop using climate data that essentially said, uh, the, the impact that you experience is a function of hazard. So how, um, flooding is going to intensify or uh, heat and humidity conditions are going to intensify. Times exposure, meaning where the hazard exists, do we also have uh, people that live there, physical assets that exist there, economic activity that, that takes place in those geographies. And then vulnerability as the, the third part of that equation, meaning um, if you have a building that's exposed to a certain amount of flooding, what's the extent of damage that building might experience? And so what we essentially did uh, working with this climate data is to quantify a whole set of socioeconomic impacts that could be experienced in different geographies. So I can actually even share one example of that. Um, I come originally from India, uh, and so this was one of the, the most stark examples um, emerging from our research, uh, and, and Christopher can, can I'm sure add, add on plenty. Uh, what we did was um, to look at two different types of climatic effects. The first is, heat and humidity conditions rising to the point where labor productivity is affected. So human beings, um, our, our ability to work outside is impaired as heat and humidity conditions rise because we tire more easily, need to take more frequent breaks. And in economic terms, that essentially translates to reduced labor productivity or a loss of effective working hours. Right. And so you see that in the map, the first row, the map set of maps in the first row, we looked at a, a high emissions RCP 8.5 scenario, and you see just going from left to right that as temperature conditions intensify for the world, um, we start to see more and more 
outdoor working hours affected as a result of these changes. Now you overlay that with a country like India, where a large share of GDP, uh, a large share of employment is in outdoor sectors like agriculture, like construction. And just from that single variable, which is heat and humidity, just looking at the first order impact of lost labor productivity, there's a substantial share of GDP that could be lost by 2030. That's uh, the numbers on the right of two and a half to four and a half percent of GDP at risk. So one variable, just for looking at first order effects, we already see that scale of impact and by 2030. So this is not a 2100 phenomenon. Perhaps more worryingly is the part on the bottom. So what the part on the top describes is just chronic shifts in heat and humidity levels. But we also see that the likelihood of lethal heat waves. And so these are not heat waves we've really ever experienced on the planet. They are heat waves that are so intense that healthy human beings sitting in the shade would be affected. Um, and we start to see more and more parts of the, both India as well as the subcontinent more broadly exposed to increased likelihood of such heat waves. By 2050, we estimate in India up to about 500 million people can live in regions with a 14% annual likelihood of such a heat wave, not a cumulative likelihood of an annual likelihood. So over the period of a decade, you're almost guaranteed to have one such heat wave in this, in this scenario we modeled here. And so this is an example of where we can take the climate data, we can overlay it with things like where people live, how vulnerable human bodies are to these conditions, to then create the, the right kind of data um, to both spur action on decarbonization, but also um, to, to the point Juliet was making on adaptation and resilience and think about the types of, of mechanisms to put in place to manage against these effects. So that's just a, a one very stark example that's particularly close to my heart. I think when we translate this into the private sector, we're also seeing a lot of interest from um, various types of private sector companies. Christopher mentioned investors and, and financial institutions. They're obviously very interested in these kind of data because they're making oftentimes long-term investment or long-term lending decisions. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of interest from not surprisingly companies that have physical assets um, because they are capital intensive, they're exposed to, to a whole range of hazards. And then the third category of companies that is companies that have long supply chains because that creates vulnerability in different parts of the supply chain um, and creates exposures. Uh, as COVID has revealed, supply chains are probably more vulnerable than many of us realized. And so um, I think the, the, this interest on understanding risk exposures and ways to manage risks um, across a, a globalized economy is also an area of emerging interest. Just two examples, but there I'm sure other panelists have, have many, many more. Okay, Matthew, I'm wondering, um, are you like, are you, are you changing the housing market? Have you already changed the housing market? Uh, what evidence do you have, or how do you seek out evidence for your impact? Yeah, so um, it's a great question, and what we, because we actually model everything at the property level and, and give it freely available, kind of as Christopher was talking about, that we are really trying to uh, avoid this idea of a paywall so that we can um, have a, a, a dissemination of information so everyone's on the, the same playing field when looking at risk. Uh, we make that available at a, a property level and then uh, buyers and sellers of real estate then have this, this information at their fingertips through integrations like realtor.com. So when you're actually looking at a home now, when you're buying or selling a home, it's one of the things that are listed there, which is here's your flood factor and here's how your flood risk will change for this property over the next 30 years, the, the period of a mortgage. And what we're seeing is that it's just really opening up people's eyes to the level of risk that exists. Uh, and really the people that want to live by the ocean and love the view of the ocean are still going to pay and live by the ocean. It's just an understanding of there's much more inherent risk than you probably thought about doing that. So how do you actually have something that's a risk transfer product like an in insurance policy? Or how do you make long-term investments knowing that that price of an insurance policy may go up over time? And the unfortunate downside to that is there's a whole bunch of people right now too that have flood risks that aren't really aware of it. And so when they're looking at that, they've already made their investments. So the question is, how do we protect those folks that are in this investment, they have a significant amount of flood risk. It's getting worse over time. Those flood insurance policies are going to increase in price for them. And now this home that they've paid for and that is for the vast majority of us, your most valuable asset is now actually depreciating in value because the cost of ownership is much higher than you maybe have thought it was a year ago, two years ago and kind of going into the future. So we're seeing a bunch of different things play out there where um, 
based on the amount of data that we present and that it's for every single property, people are, are taking it on and, and understanding it in different ways and applying it. And so it's the other thing that we're doing as well is that it's not just about uh, an individual residence. Um, so if you look up a property, one property might have a certain flood risk today and into the future, but really that broader question um, that we're thinking about from a neighborhood, a city or a county, what else is at risk, right? So we also quantify things like um, uh, wastewater treatment facilities and Superfund sites and airports and hospitals and police stations and schools and government buildings, all of these different things that have levels of risk that also are very important to that uh, individual asset. So you can paint a full picture of risk. And so you can really think about what is uh, what are those things that have that vulnerability and then how do you protect against it or how do you make the smart decision, whether you're an elected official or you're just uh, your average American looking to, to buy their first home or, or sell their home. And can I just add maybe one thing to what Matthew just said, because this last point I think is a really profound one when it comes to physical climate risks. Um, again, we've seen it with, with the pandemic that a lot of these risks are systemic, right? Um, and so physical climate risks, it, there's one, uh, one way to look at it to say, um, is my home exposed to flooding? Um, but it's actually much more profound risk than that in the sense of, do I live in a, in a community that is exposed to flooding? Is my road exposed to flooding? Road to my home exposed to flooding? Is my school district exposed to flooding? And so it's important to realize that this risk is not just isolated in specific pockets. This is risk to an entire system. And you may be exposed because you're directly exposed, but also because the, the environment around you, the ecosystem around you is exposed to risk. You think there's a relationship between the response to the pandemic and what the response to climate risks might be going forward? Like, have we have we learned anything? Question for everybody. I, well, how about I pivot to what I wanted to say and sort of answer your question, if I may? <laughs> All right, cool. I want to show my picture, um, and so this is California. Um, this. Okay, so hopefully, let's see if it's going to full. Right, so this was 2020, the CZU complex fire in Santa Cruz. This is the great highway, Highway 1, a very beautiful way to go. What this photo is showing, what we're dealing with, you can throw the pandemic on here too, right? Because this was all going on during the pandemic. And what I really like about this photo is that not, you know, at first glance, you think this is a fire photo but it's also a coastal erosion photo. We also have earthquakes and landslides and all sorts of stuff. So the challenge that we have is it's all, I think of that line in um, Dan in real life with Steve Carell when he's like, you know, add it to the tab. I mean, all of this is happening at the same time in California. These fires were happening during the pandemic. And so we had thousands, I don't know the exact number of people that needed to be evacuated and where were they going to go? How were they going to be sheltered um, in a safe way so that they weren't exposed to COVID? I mean, that really was the challenge that we were facing and still are facing at the time. So I think thinking about it from the, the California point of view um, here, and I'll, I'll pop this off at this point, it's enough doom and gloom. Um, is the challenge of not only understanding the risk and I appreciate everything that's being said about wanting to identify, okay, the schoolhouse is at, is at risk and the hospital, et cetera, but it's also the interconnections among those. So, you know, it's not just about showing which one's at risk, but you know, what happens when one goes down, when the power goes out, what's the trickle on effect? One of my colleagues is in the audience, Susie Moser, we did a study about this with city of LA and county of LA. And then what happens when you have a flood on top of a fire or a uh, flood after fire, all these different compounding and concatenating events. So this is um, this is where we're trying to go when we're, at least in our program, we just got a bunch of money through a pretty amazing historic climate budget last year. And then there's another one rolling through this year that's looking at this like regional scale adaptation. Like how do we look at what's happening at the regional scale? How do we plan for that? And then how do we take it to the next step of implementation? So a little bit of a punt on your COVID question, but somehow tied it into, we're, we're dealing with all of this all at the same time. And so that's where we 
uh, that's where our challenge. And I just would add one more piece to that, which is this is where talking to each other comes in, right? Um, mm. The maps and the tools and all of that, super important. Again, I'm a scientist, I love science. But the piece that where we fall down is in the communication and connecting with each other. You can have the best process in the world. And if one landowner gets upset, they can derail it. And now you have no, you know, sea level rise adaptation plan in place anymore. Right. So this is the challenge that we're, we're struggling with. Absolutely. Yeah. I, Feel free I, to make yeah. up your own questions that are better than mine. <laughs> Well, I did want to jump in on the COVID bit, uh, because to me, what is fascinating about COVID is the extent to which it provided a yardstick. If we think back in the, in the first year of COVID, where global emissions went down by about 7%, it's exactly that pace that we need to maintain in order to achieve net zero in some notion of on time. And of course, now in this year, we're already going back up. So from my perspective, COVID is very intriguing as a yardstick. So for, that you know, helps us understand the dimensionality of the problem vis-a-vis -vis decarbonization. Also an, an interesting uh, view of, of what's needed from a global response uh, when you look at COVID, right? So when you think about all the countries that got together, we thought of it as a global issue. We all needed to solve this together. Let's put money into vaccine development. Let's all react as much as possible so that we can come up with some type of solution. That's the type of actual action that's needed to start to take on climate, but we don't view it as the same eminent threat to our species that we did with COVID, which is kind of the, the bonkers thing about all of this and why the physical aspect of, of climate risk is so important. Because if you don't translate it into these metrics like we were just talking about on GDP and human health lives in, in India, or whether it's physical aspects, um, looking at flood risk or the value of an asset, those are the things that we can as humans make tangible and understand, but we don't get this idea of GHGs and these amorphous one degree, two degree, what does that actually mean? So the translation and communication of it into the same type of scale of an issue that, that COVID is, is what we need uh, and why kind of both aspects of this from a physical modeling and from a transitional risk and all these other elements of so all the pieces of the puzzle have to be working together and we all have to be kind of speaking in the same way uh, to Juliet's point as well. And I, I completely agree, Matt, Matthew, but, and I would add one other thing, just given the topic of this panel, um, is just how important data is for decision-making. Um, uh, I mean, I, I made this this remark a little bit jokingly, but it's it's true that we didn't really comprehend how vulnerable global supply chains were, right? As we talked to a lot of companies, they maybe had visibility into their tier one suppliers, but their tier two, three suppliers didn't really understand that. Um, I think also there, there are then parallels as we think about climate, what are the metrics that we need to measure? Where, what is the data that we need as we think about managing these risks? Um, uh, so I think that there are a lot of lessons that we can take from COVID that, that apply to, to climate change and addressing physical climate risks. Yeah, that's obviously central, uh, Julia, just, just talk to each other. It couldn't be more simply put. And yet, at least in the United States, this is a country that has seems to have trouble talking to each other. And I was wondering, in your experience, um, do these conversations go more smoothly on the professional one to one level more than they seem to on the aggregate political level is like all the way down to local decision makers. Do you see uh, the kind of division that, um, you know, that dominates the headline the other day or are people quietly, you know, more on top of this than the country would appear to be on a whole? Well, I can, I can go first on that. I don't think as a, country that we're more on top of it. But when I think about our municipal engagement, it's very apolitical. It's very much results oriented, data driven. It's simply a stakeholder group, a constituency, you might say, that really wants answers. They're not necessarily all that concerned with the political leanings of where those answers might originate from in some very diffuse sense. So at that level, um, 
there might be a cause for optimism because fundamentally that's where the rubber hits the road, quote unquote. I mean, this whole notion of operational decisions in the context of adaptation, these are typically hyper-local. And so the ability to work with municipal leaders and have a very open conversation that doesn't have political sideboards uh, is something that we have found over and over again in our municipal engagements. I think generally speaking, that's true. Um, kind of depends where you are too. I mean, um, if you're talking across Massachusetts, you know, maybe different piece, parts of Massachusetts will have different types of engagement. I think um, there's definitely an opening now with all of the impacts that we've been experiencing to talk about it, but it's still sort of thinking about it as an emergency response versus a long-term planning. So that's one of the challenges that still is making that translation from thinking about this as a one-off event that just happened to multiple of these events. And that, that's where I find that there's still a little bit of a, you know, a disconnect. And then you can have a, so as I, you know, I mentioned quickly in passing, you know, sea level rise is one of the big things that's been what I focused on in my career. You can have very solid stakeholder engagement processes, great science, you know, the whole thing. And then you really get one person in the public that doesn't, maybe hasn't been a part of the conversation and it can, you know, it can derail the conversation. And so um, the, the challenge that I find is that um, it's about trying to find the way to bring everyone along through from the beginning um, so that you can try to offset that as much as possible. I mean, and, and, and shifting it away from a language of loss of losing something to, you know, community. And this is where it ties back to COVID where unfortunately, right, we, we saw some differing uh, systems at play in terms of protecting yourself, others, et cetera. So um, those are just some initial thoughts. I'm sure I have more, but I'll pause for someone else to speak. Yeah, I think um, uh, just building on what both Christopher and Juliet actually said, this is one way I think resilience is a different, has a different set of challenges than decarbonization. Because um, in some sense, um, you would you would expect that communities are actually incentivized to address resilience issues because they are themselves affected by them, right? Whereas decarbonization, a community can decarbonize, but if, if everybody else is not uh, taking action, then there's only so much that emissions go down in the world. However, I think there are a whole set of different challenges that the resilience agenda faces. Uh, and Juliet alluded to some of them, right? I think there are really tough choices around where do you make investments on resilience versus where do you choose to retreat? Uh, if you think about the entire resilience toolkit, um, which of the, the different levers that can be applied to resilience, whether I'm again with the supply chain example, you know, shifting where you're uh, production is located to raising inventory levels. How do you make choices against a whole range of different resilience levers? How do you um, decide what to invest in now versus invest in later, right? With the timing of resilience decisions. Um, how do you engage the voices of communities in decision-making? Uh, Matthew alluded to the fact that, you know, a, a lot of transparency that gets created around risks actually does hurt, uh, has the potential to hurt individual homeowners in, in terms of the, the devaluation of their homes. So how do you manage those kinds of effects? So it's, all, it's almost a different set of challenges than when you think about uh, decarbonization. And, and I think we, we need to, to figure out how to address those kinds of challenges when it comes to the resilience agenda. I want to start moving in a second uh, through the audience questions and everyone's encouraged to uh, pop, your, pop your questions in there. Uh, I, there seems uh, the, there's agreement on the call that, that climate risk information should be free, and yet there's a uh, there's definitely a growing number of companies that are uh, providing services for uh, uh, for companies or, or investors, uh, you know, for a fee, and it's it's a, it seems like a growing business uh, to the extent you know we have any information about them. Uh, what's your sense of the role of um, private companies in, I don't know, providing some sort of premium service. What does a premium service look like? Are there any? How do you, how do you work with uh, people trying to charge for what you seem to be doing anyway? I mean, from, from our perspective, uh, we, we at First Street have noticed um, uh, consolidation 
of the amount of uh, for-profit players in the market as well. So there's a, a growing number of them, but the ones that are more mature have all been, um, not all, but a good chunk of them have been acquired as of late um, through Moody's acquisitions or uh, ICE or any of these larger corporations that are pulling it in because they see a very lucrative um, uh, revenue stream coming from what is a very, very critical um, piece of information that folks need. So it, it does make sense from a for-profit perspective that the investment and acquisition is all happening in that space. Unfortunately, what that leaves is um, a lack of information for your average American, or when you're looking at the state and local and federal level, um, there's just a, a few number of providers that you're going to have to work with on this space in this space to actually get to the, the data that you're after. So it's a difficult one to, to watch, but it's a more meaningful role for, for us to play, for Woodwell to play. Like these are the, the players that on the nonprofit side are, are stepping up to raise the philanthropic money that's needed to try and create these models and, and have more of a dissemination of information like I was talking about earlier to try and ensure that there's ways that people can from a, uh, from a peer reviewed open methodology and transparent way understand risk. Um, and, you know, unfortunately that that's what we're seeing happen in the market, but it makes perfect sense on why you would be seeing that and why anyone who's on the kind of, uh, the for-profit side would be wanting to, to move in that direction. Thank you. If there's no other, uh, thoughts on that, um, maybe I'll start looking at the audience questions here. Um, Good one. What are the most common questions that regulators have when trying to understand climate-driven financial risk? What are the questions you get? I should set up a, a, a Jeopardy-style uh, countdown clock. <laughs> well, so when you say regulators, are you talking about some? I think regulators, legislators, mayors, you know, what, um, how, how are people, how are elected officials uh, prepared to start dealing with this? They ask it of questions. So they want a number, right? They want a number for each thing so that they feel like they, right. And that is, that also is part of the challenge um, is, is to actually make this point about how um, mitigation, you know, removal of greenhouse gas emissions is different than resilience. You can have a target for reduction of CO2 in the atmosphere and get to net zero, but what is the target for resilience? There's lots of important work being done on resilience metrics these days. So the, the way that we're thinking about it is um, the, uh, the adaptive pathways approach, right? Like looking at your worst case scenario, knowing what that, what that number is, and then figuring out the path to make sure you're protected to that and protected along the way. So the education around how to do adaptation pathways planning has been a big focus of the state. Um, so I had another thought, but I lost it. So I'll stop there, but. Thank you. One, one thing that we, we get asked and what we kind of, our tool is and data is used a lot for Eric is, um, the understanding of where the pockets are risk, of risk are within a certain geographic area. Uh, and then what we, we see is that with that understanding, then a number of questions come up because you start to get with a number at that, like Julia is talking about. And then the question is, well, do we look at buyouts, um, as that was mentioned, which is a very touchy subject, right? Because then you're talking about actually moving people out of their homes and asking them to leave at the place that they, they call home. Uh, or do you look at putting in adaptation and what is the ROI of adaptation in that area of town that would actually protect those homes and is it better served there or in a different part of town? And then you end up with really difficult questions on uh, the tax revenue that comes from certain portions versus others and then um, the, the kind of socioeconomic questions around uh, those. So it goes into a very, very tricky area very quickly, but it all starts with an idea of how do we identify where the areas of risk are so we can start with those? And it's always trying to be based in analytical approaches so that you can you can maximize your decisions with whatever limited budget you may or may not have to, to address them. I remembered my yeah. thought when you yeah. said ROI. Sorry, may I speak to it really Please quickly? Please go ahead. 
so, and I think, and you had said this early on with the ROI, right? So uh, there's different types of ROI. And one of the things that we're struggling or trying to proactively address is where do we invest? Um, we know there have been places that have been historically and currently underinvested. And so is that the priority? Um, I can give you my personal opinion. Um, I'm sure you Please can do. guess it. So, um, and so the, what, how do you define ROI? Is it just the number of buildings or is it the number of people displaced? Who gets displaced is what, you know? So I think that's where the analytics sort of fall down and comes back to that piece of the conversation and the community driven approach to this and having conversations across all sectors of the community to be able to bring that in. That's one of the things that we're working on in, in trying to bring together a definition of vulnerable communities that's pretty broad and expansive that allows the state to figure out where it needs to invest. There's a bunch of questions about uh, consumer and, in, oh, I'm sorry, Mekla. Mekla yeah, actually, actually maybe just one other quick thought on this. The one piece we haven't quite talked about is um, regulators in the sense of, uh, of financial regulators. And um, what we are seeing that is uh, quite interesting, starting with a, a few jurisdictions, but now expanding to more is um, stress testing of financial institutions and um, the requirement that that banks um, in particular stress test their portfolios against both physical risks as well as transition risks, because there's a growing recognition that ultimately um, both physical and transition risks can create um, financial impacts. And so we're starting to see um, a lot of uh, banks both work with climate data, but then again, this, this leads to an entire data ecosystem that needs to be created that also there's the bank itself and um, uh, trying to, to, to understand climate data, but then the counterparties that they lend to understanding their exposures, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a whole cascading ecosystem of, of data needs that, that gets created. But I expect in the coming years, more and more jurisdictions to require those kinds of stress tests. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's a bunch of questions about individual responsibility, about uh, what individuals can do, what consumers can do. Uh, how individuals can can see uh, the effects of, of what's a global problem. There's a question for um, uh, 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 Christopher on uh, on just that. When when can uh, individuals uh, might be, when might individuals be expected to see um, uh, climate change or uh, progress against climate change? There's a, a, a question for Juliet on a, what what did you mean by uh, sort of bringing everybody in from the beginning? There's even a question for me on uh, uh, on Bloom, where, where does Bloomberg stand on banning advertising from fossil fuel companies? We are for it. Uh, Bloomberg Green doesn't uh, doesn't uh, uh, do fossil fuel advertising. So what do you think? It's a it's a classic question. I, my own two cents, I guess, is that you know. It, the oil industry has spent a lot of billions of dollars over many years to try to persuade people that individuals have the big role to play here. Uh, so in the, the context of that, what, what do y'all think? Um, I, I can start. Um, you know, one of the things we did recently in the, in the report that, that Eric, you mentioned at the, at the start of this is to um, quantify emissions across a whole set of what we call energy and land use systems, right? So power, I would say, contributes, you know, 30% to overall CO2 emissions industry anywhere from 20 to 30%. Mobility, um, which is driving another 30%. Agriculture, maybe less of a contribution towards CO2, but certainly a contribution towards methane. So if you look at each of these systems, the ability for um, individuals to influence each of these systems there is a role, right, that individuals can play. Um, how we um, shape our diets, how we shape our consumer purchasing behavior, how we shape what we drive, how much we drive does play a role. Um, so I, I think it's important to recognize that there is an individual role. Having said that, there's also a societal a systemic role, right? I think that is the tragedy of the problem of emissions reduction that every stakeholder needs to play a role either because they directly contribute to emissions or indirectly participate in global value chains that contribute to emissions. Um, so I, I don't think we can reach that net zero goal without everyone participating in some way. 
Yeah, I would, I would very much echo that. And I think in terms of when a particular individual can experience climate change, I mean, that's actually a big thing that we have to educate, particularly our corporate partners on, that it's not this thing that could happen. It's very much already here. And so we have this kind of, I mean, in some sense, maybe the best way to think about what we do at Woodwell in the risk group is we really act as translators because there's so much of building up a common vocabulary so we can even have an intelligent conversation, which gets back to some of the other threads that other panelists have, of course, articulated about bringing everyone with. But in terms of when you can expect to witness some form of negative climate impact, that already has indeed happened wherever you are. It's, it's very hard to contrive a situation where that's not the case. And in terms of this you know, meeting in the middle, it really needs to happen between top down such we have kind of the right regulatory incentives and nudges in place. That's all good and well, but there does need to be this bottom up behavior as Mekla had just articulated or we're simply not going to solve the problem. Yeah, and one of, one of the things that I always pay attention to is the, um, the Yale longitudinal studies on uh, climate opinions, which are always mm -hmm. a helpful kind of indication over time of where we are and where you've kind of seen this agreement that climate change is happening and we've gone well past the, the belief that it's 50-50 you know, within the states and it's well past up in kind of the 70% that it's happening. Now, the question is, um, is it going to happen to you personally? Is it going to impact you personally? And that's where it's happening. It's going to impact people in this country, but it's not going to impact me. And until we have this belief that it's going to impact me personally and that understanding that it, that it will, are we going to get to these larger questions around what can I do to solve it? And I think that the best way that you can is from the, the local level. It's, there's all these individual things and individual small actions that you can take, but it's a collective action that has to happen at the, you know, the neighborhood, the city, the county level where we're all talking about this. And to Juliet's point, like what is you know, ROI from your perspective or success from your perspective in your community? And what are you guys trying to do together, whether it's adaptation or mitigation that's going into place? Um, but without that collective group, then we're, we're not going to get to the larger goals. So it's all the, the many acts of, of the individuals that will then collectively get us there. A uh, question about, uh, maybe this has been answered, but it's probably worth focusing again. Um, what kind of data works best? Or maybe what kind of data works best on who? Uh, and, and who, where do you get pushback from uh, most often, regardless of how good your data is. Yeah, I can, I'll take a quick stab. Um, the data that works best is very much depends on the use case. If you're in the business of flood risk modeling, that's gonna be a little bit different if you're trying to understand heat stress as induced by a very toxic combination of high temperatures and high humidities. It's also relevant what timeline you happen to be targeting. If you wanna know something about next year versus 2030 versus end of century. And there's a very dense kind of ecosystem of data products out there. And in some sense, that's very much the special sauce, right? So you can construe all this very dense tapestry of data as raw ingredients. And what you get from a good CSP, a climate service provider, is actually a dish that you can do something with. It means something. You would answer the question, quote unquote. The other bit of the question that I did want to briefly touch base on, the most static that we get is about kind of hyper-local data. So this, so this notion that you can drill down to a latitude and longitude coordinate out to eight decimal places and that you need to be able to do that to meaningfully understand physical climate risk. That is something that comes up over and over again. That's, not, that's simply not the case but it is a constant you know, bit of education that we have to do, particularly with corporate partners. Yeah, and, oh, sorry, go ahead, Julian. Um, yeah, I think just building on what Christopher said, um, you know, I think there is often not the best understanding of uncertainty when it comes to climate data. Um, so if you think about the, the cascading um, chain of uncertainties that exist, right? There is uncertainty about what emissions trajectory you're on. Are we on a low emissions trajectory or high emissions trajectory? Should we use RCP 8.5? Should we use RCP 4.5, 6.5? A lot of debate there. A second kind of uncertainty is then even given 
um, a certain emissions trajectory. There's a whole range of climate models that give you all somewhat different outcomes, right? So which climate model is the quote unquote best one? Um, there's a third kind of uncertainty, which is uh, to do with, uh, as Christopher was describing, the localization of the data, right? So if the data is good at a, I don't know, 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer level, is it also good at a five kilometer by five kilometer level? And then there's a whole range of uncertainties on actually the impacts of the, these climate hazards that you're experiencing, right? So is, um, is the, the flood proofing that I factored into my facility actually an appropriate one or not? Are the higher order effects that I've considered actually appropriate ones or not? So firstly, I think there's the need to educate people about this chain of uncertainties and where there is actually uncertainty to the point that it leads to bad decision making versus where there is uncertainty that is within the bounds of allowing for decision making. So the one that we often get tripped up on is that very first one I mentioned about which emissions trajectory you're on. We've had a lot of debate with many, many stakeholders about we are not on an RCP 8.5 trajectory. And my response is always that almost doesn't matter, right? If you think about RCP 8.5, effectively what we're saying is it's a two degree Celsius world if, if you look at RCP 8.5 in 2050. So let's forget about the emissions trajectory you're on. Let's think about uh, and Juliet, you mentioned this a little bit, right? This end state that we're trying to solve for, regardless of the timing of that end state and then work backwards from there. So anyway, as, as we think about each of these uncertainties, there's different tools and ways to manage it. And it's important for stakeholders that use these data to understand and comprehend the uncertainties and then factor that in appropriately into their decision-making. Uh, good question here. What, uh, if you had a magic wand, and you can measure something that heretofore hasn't been measurable, what would you want to know? What would you measure that would help everybody make better decisions? May I take a stab at that and answer the question around the, um, what does it mean to bring people along from the beginning? Because I think that's my magic wand, is there isn't a, a single thing that we need to measure. I think it's you know, summarizing what we've been all saying, right? Like people need to see themselves at risk and as part of the solution, seeing the solution as being something that is both going to help draw down our risk, but also protect from it. And starting, you know, these are just some thoughts that were coming to me, you know, sort of starting with what you know, just having people under, you know, be able to pull from their real world, world experience and see how this will accelerate into the future. And that to the question around how do you do this, it's really in working with partners. Um, you know, we're a huge state, California, other states on the call are also huge states, right? So we need to be working with our community-based organizations that are in there, they have the trust, they are experiencing their own issues today. They are the ones who will be the, the, the missing kind of piece to getting, bringing everyone along. So. I would urge the funding to go towards supporting the community-based organizations to help participate in the conversation. Yeah, if I could just briefly make a point on that. In terms of the municipal outreach that we do, that is the most important thing. All of the science issues, uncertainty issues, those are manageable. That is simply education, but it's time and it's commitment. The hardest thing is relationship building and to not have it be transactional. That is fundamental. Otherwise, you're not gonna move forward. Okay, I think we are uh, just about out of time. Uh, there's a, a bunch of questions sort of related to um, access to information. How do you find things uh, for, for various, uh, uh, how do you measure success as well? Uh, my understanding is that uh, there'll be a, a sort of wrap up email with, uh, with resources to those on the call. Um, but uh, maybe just close it out before we give it back to Bethany. What, um, I don't know, one of my favorite things to ask people is just like, why do you do this? You know, you could be professional bowlers or like chefs, but you know, you're doing this. So uh, I'm always curious what people's answers are because it may lead others to discover their climate thing. I'll just go, I don't know. And I quit every day, but yet here I am and I come back. I mean, cause what else is, you know, this is what feels the most important. It's hard. But. I, uh, I, I personally started on the climate side because I'm a, a marketer by trade and I 
view this as by far the largest marketing and communications problem that we've ever had. Um, so I couldn't couldn't help but not get involved in some way, um, which has led me to um, what we're working on today at, at First Street. Um, yeah, yeah I can, um, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, sorry, go on. Okay, I will go. Um, so I could not be a professional bowler. I think the best game I've ever bowled is 204. I remember it specifically. Whoa. I was very, very proud. I had five strikes in a row that day. It will go down in history. Um, the reason I work on this is, or one reason, there are actually, they're, they're actually several, but the one I wanted to highlight is, for me, this is an absolutely compelling intellectual puzzle. I, there are just so many things. It never stops. It's in some sense boundless. And I can just so easily get lost in it. I, I find it intellectually just incredibly, incredibly stimulating. Yeah, and maybe just to close, I think it's, I, I would say three things that Juliet, exactly what you said, right? What else would you work on? Um, Christopher, what you said, I mean, the, the scale of intellectual amazingness of this and uh, is, is unparalleled. But also uh, the third thing I would add is the, incredible multidisciplinary nature of it. I mean, if we think about all of us on the call here, we all come from completely different backgrounds and we're all looking at different aspects of this problem. There's, I, th I think, very few problems in the world that engage with, with people from such different backgrounds, such different interests in the, in the way that this problem does. Well, thank you all very much for joining. Uh, it's a fascinating topic uh, and uh, we all look forward to watching uh, your work uh, as we continue this adventure. So turn it back over to Bethany. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you, Juliet, Matthew, Christopher, and Makala. That was incredibly interesting. Talk about stimulating um, and powerful. Thank you to Woodwell in Massachusetts for pulling together these great panelists and this series. This is just the beginning. You are all learning about how measuring physical risk today. Join us on February 15th to talk about what regulators need and on March 1st about using those tools to promote resilience and environmental justice and decision-making to drill more deeply on that topic. Thank you all and see you again soon. <laughs>